Hello, my name is Frederick Ruberg from Boston University and Boston Medical Center from the Amyloidosis Center in the section of cardiovascular medicine. And it's my pleasure today to present this quick tip video on cardiac amyloidosis, quick tips in diagnosis. For the next 10 to 15 minutes, we'll talk about endomyocardial biopsy as the gold standard for cardiac amyloidosis. It's necessary in, in a vanishing number, minority number of, of cases of AL and ATTR amyloidosis. I hope to uh, convince that you of that. We'll talk about echocardiography and strain imaging in particular as and its specific pattern that is uh, that can that can be uh, used to suggest the presence of cardiac amyloidosis. We'll talk about nuclear imaging in great detail because no nuclear imaging has really revolutionized our diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis, um, and and cardiac amyloidosis can be made uh, can be diagnosed uh, non-invasively using nuclear imaging and a combination of plasma cell uh, marker testing in the blood and the urine. And finally, we'll speak about genotyping and how it's essential uh, in the cases of ATTR amyloidosis to determine whether the ATTR amyloidosis is hereditary or wild type. So let's start about uh, in the office. <clears throat> You're seeing a patient with cardiac amyloidosis, or at least uh, you think the patient may have cardiac amyloidosis. What do you order? Well, everybody's going to get an EKG, um, standard of care, and most people will have an echocardiogram in their office or certainly refer their patients for an echo. An echo is really the standard of care first imaging test for cardiac amyloidosis. We'll talk about what you see in that case. But if you're thinking cardiac amyloidosis in the office, I would urge you also to get a BNP or anti-proBNP, a troponin I or troponin T, check pre-albumin, measure TTR concentration. Lower pre-albumins are associated with hereditary disease and worse prognosis. And then you'll want to check for the plasma cell dyscrasia markers, serum-free light chains, kappa and lambda, which will also give you a kappa and lambda ratio, serum immunofixation electrophoresis, not SPEP. Many centers will not do a serum immunofixation if the SPEP is normal, but you, and this is typically true with send out testing, but you wanna order an immunofixation electrophoresis. The SPEP identifies paraproteins at a very high titer. In AL amyloidosis, usually the plasma cell burden is relatively low. And so the, the free light chain level may not be that high, but still very pathological. So you have to order the immunofixation electrophoresis as well as the free light chain and not the SPEP. And finally, a renal function panel is useful because we know that EGFR associates with prognosis in ATTR amyloidosis uh, and also is extremely important in AL amyloidosis. So this is an echocardiogram illustrating the utility of global longitudinal strain. And at the bottom, you can see the reproduced recommendations from the recently published consensus recommendations for non-invasive imaging and cardiac amyloidosis first authored by Sharmila Dorbala, last authored by Jameson Bork. This paper was published in the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology and the Journal of Cardiac Failure. Now, in echocardiography, as you know, amyloidosis typically causes thickened, uh, thickened walls, typically 12 millimeters or more, diastolic dysfunction, um, and uh, maybe thickened valves and maybe pericardial effusion, increased filling pressures, non-specific findings, findings that you see, say, in hypertensive heart disease. Global longitudinal strain by uh, analysis allows you to identify specific patterns, particularly this pattern called the apical sparing pattern, uh, where, uh, where the apical strains are preserved and the basal strains are reduced, uh, indicative of amyloidosis. This is not in itself diagnostic, but certainly raises the suspicion. And in certain uh, series, the AUC for identification approach is 0.9. Uh, when looking at comparing to other other uh, different other metrics. But findings that are not suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis by these consensus recommendations include things that you would, I think, postulate, normal wall thickness and normal diastolic function, for example, whereas strongly suggestive are increased wall thickness, um, typical strain pattern showing apical sparing, diastolic dysfunction, et cetera, uh, things you would, uh, uh, I think, would predict. And anything that's equivocal is in the middle. But as I said, echo itself is not diagnostic of cardiac amyloidosis. The next test that many cardiologists would reach for would be cardiac MR, tremendously useful, indispensable test. And depending upon the age of the patient, I would argue is probably the next appropriate test. I think for older patients, I would probably argue that ATTR screening with PYP imaging, as I'll show you next, is probably the next best test. But for a younger person or someone in whom you're suspicious of AL amyloidosis, CMR is definitely the next test to get. Why? Because with CMR, we can characterize the tissue in a way that we cannot with echo. We do that by means of T1 mapping, extracellular volume determination, and late gadolinium enhancement. And this figure here shows the different ways in which we characterize patients by using LGE, late enhancement, 
native T1 and extracellular volume by CMR. This patient has no LGE and has a normal T1 and normal extracellular volume. This patient has ATTR amyloidosis and a subendocardial LGE pattern with a T1 that's above the normal range and an ECV that's above the normal range. And typically when the ECV gets above 0.4, that's indicative of cardiac amyloidosis. This patient has extensive transmural ATT, uh, ATTR amyloidosis L, and a transmural LGE with a marked increase in T1 and a marked increase in ECV. So when you see a pattern like this, a, a global sub subendocardial pattern or transmural pattern that does not follow a coronary territory in a thickened heart with reduced stroke volume, that is suggestive of ATTR or AL amyloidosis and should be explored further. Cardiac MR also provides us great insight into understanding these other metrics that we have from other modalities. And I really like this figure because it uses extracellular volume as a means to predict the abnormality in these other, other uh, variables derived from, say, echo. So high burden diseases or thing, uh, met metrics are things like LVEF and TAPSI. You have to have a lot of amyloid in the heart to drop the LVEF out of the normal range and make the TAPSI in the right heart abnormal. With low burden disease, uh, disease measures are things like this, E over E prime, measurement of diastolic function, myocardial contraction fraction, wall thickness, relative wall thickness, and lo longitudinal strain. So at relatively low levels of ECV increase, but still in the amyloid range, these numbers will be abnormal. And as you can see, as it increases, ECV increases, more of these metrics become abnormal. And these are intermediate uh, measures. So ECV really informs our understanding of the continuum of amyloid deposition in ADL and ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, and again, this is a very, very useful tool uh, for patients. Now, if you have an older patient, say over the age of 60 with suspected cardiac amyloidosis, I personally, unless you suspect AL strongly for other reasons, say macroglossia, uh, periorbital ecchymosis, uh, or nephrotic range proteinuria as uh, markers of AL, I would go for the PYP scan next. Why? Because the PYP scan is the only way that you can make the diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis without the means of a tissue biopsy. Now, I say PYP because that's the scan we use in the United States, technetium pyrophosphate. In Europe, they use DPD or HMDP as the principal tracers. The concept is still generally the same. These bone-seeking radio tracers are injected, an incubation period occurs either at one or three hours, and the uptake in the heart is compared to the uptake in the ribs uh, or the sternum. And patients who have no uptake, and they'll illustrate it here, grade zero, uh, do not have ATTR amyloidosis. Patients who have grade one uptake do not have ATTR amyloidosis. The patients who have grade two or grade three uptake have evidence of ATTR amyloidosis in the context of a normal plasma cell te uh, testing. Uh, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. It's really, really important that the planar uh, evaluation is evaluated, is, is confirmed by SPECT. And this shows here, uh, this is SPECT CT showing zero, one, two, and three uptake, different degrees. The uptake is myocardial and it looks like almost like a perfusion scan when the, uh, when the PYP uh, uptake is grade three. You also can perform a heart to contralateral chest ratio, measuring the mean counts of the heart over the contralateral chest. And when you exceed 1.5 at one hour, that's also strongly suggestive of ATTR amyloidosis. Now, the PYP imaging must be interpreted in the context of plasma cell testing. One cannot make the diagnosis of ATTR amyloidosis just based upon the PYP because a proportion of AL amyloidosis patients will have diagnostic uptake. Many of them will have some uptake, but a small proportion, maybe 10%, we don't really know, will have diagnostic uptake looking like they have ATTR, but they actually have AL. So the plasma cell testing must be done. Anybody who has serum, and as I, as I mentioned in the first slide, serum-free light chains, immunofixation electrophoresis, and uh, the serum and the urine, although I would argue that the urine immunofixation could possibly be avoided if these other two are normal, um, must be performed. Anybody who has evidence of a monoclonal protein, either by light chain testing or immunofixation, can't, you really can't interpret the TTR testing without either hematology consultation at least, and probably a tissue biopsy. It's also really important that you acquire the test in the right clinical context. As I showed you, this is a positive PYP scan, again, looking like almost like a, a myocardial perfusion study, showing diffuse uptake and, and as reconstructed in the different cardiac planes, and this is the planar scan. This is the SPECT reconstruction um, and uh, with a cardiac uh, reformat. <clears throat> this is a patient who has some TTR uptake, a PYP uptake, excuse me, on the planar scan, 
but the spec CT shows that the, the uptake is in the blood pool. So it's really important that you acquire these scans in patients who look like they have cardiac amyloidosis. At least they have some features that are consistent. Somebody with a dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, LV EDD of 65 millimeters and NEF of 20%, is very, very, very unlikely to have cardiac amyloidosis, the cause of that problem, certainly with normal wall thickness. But they may very well have blood pool uptake and yield a false positive scan. And so it's really important that, that the tests are acquired in the right clinical scenario. How about plasma cell testing? Why do you do this? Well, you can exclude AL amyloidosis almost uh, definitively by looking at plasma and urine testing. The problem is that many patients with ATTR amyloidosis have a, a coexistent monoclonal gammopathy because they are older and monoclonal gammopathy increases with age. In fact, up to 50% of patients with diagnosed ATTR amyloidosis can have an MGUS, either by serum free light chain testing or immunofixation electrophoresis. We know the presence of MGUS is important and incurs an eightfold increased risk of AL amyloidosis. And so for this reason, if a patient has a monoclonal gammopathy, you really can't interpret that PYP test Again, without hematology consultation, uh, and certainly without uh, or without tissue biopsy. And I show here the uh, the the values for the normal uh, free light and Siemens AL amyloid allergy. Uh, excuse me, uh, assay for um, for light chain testing. Um, we would argue uh, this is a publication that my colleagues and I recently reported in Jack that you can actually go up to a higher uh, free light chain ratio in patients with chronic kidney disease who are older, um, above the normal range. And I would argue anybody who has a lambda monoclonal gammopathy, that is uh, abnormal and should be definitely pursued by hematology. They would have a low ratio of below uh, 0.26. This, uh, this table really kind of puts it together. So the free light chain ratio, the immunofixation, the immun electrophoresis, and the PYP test. So you can only diagnose ATTR amyloidosis if you have a normal free light chain ratio and normal immunofixation. Uh, that patient with a positive PYP scan has ATTR without further diagnosis, you should do genotyping. If this is normal or abnormal and there's a monoclonal protein by immunofixation, you really need a tissue biopsy or at least a hematology evaluation but, but to diagnose ATTR non-invasively, you need a tissue biopsy because patients can have AL amyloidosis with near normal free light chains and still an and immunofixation abnormality. And then finally, as I mentioned, in, in, with increased, um, uh, increased uh, um, uh, light chain ratio in the setting of renal dysfunction, um, you would consider whether or not a consultation or tissue biopsy is necessary. And then finally, the renal dysfunction range, <clears throat> excuse me, really depends upon um, the degree of renal dysfunction. And again, I would urge you to seek hematologic consultation to interpret. So as a cardiologist, we have to put it together. It's not just the scan, it's the scan and the light chain testing together. And you should involve your hematology colleagues if you have any question about interpretation of those results. So how do we put it all together? Um, there are many algorithms that have been reported. This one was uh, reported um, in, uh, in Jack last year, again, by uh, Maz Hanna and, uh, and colleagues. Um, and this basically goes through all the points I just said. So you suspect with amyloidosis with typical findings. So as I mentioned, increased wall thickness, um, low stroke volume, uh, normal or mildly reduced ejection fraction, global longitudinal strain showing an apical sparing pattern, increased extracellular volume by cardiac MR or diffuse longitudinal, uh, excuse me, diffuse LGE pattern. You obtain evaluation for the paraprotein. Look for the serum and urine immunofixation electrophoresis and um, free light chain testing. And if the result is abnormal, <coughs> excuse me, you can get PYP scintigraphy. And if you have def definitive uptake, um, then the patient has ATTR amyloidosis and should be genotyped. If the test is abnormal and the patient has a monoclonal protein, you can go ahead with uh, additional tissue biopsy diagnosis. Again, you would most likely obtain a hematology, colleague, uh, hematology consultation with your colleagues, but you could obtain a fat aspirate, or you can go straight to a, an endomyocardial biopsy if necessary to diagnose ATTR amyloidosis. We can diagnose AL amyloidosis from a non-cardiac biopsy, um, say, for example, a fat aspirate showing light chain amyloidosis in the setting of a monoclonal gammopathy and clinical features of, AT, of, of cardiac amyloidosis can be diagnosed as AL. But, um, but you still may, if you're thinking ATTR, may need to go to the cardiac biopsy. So for this reason, many cases of ATTR amyloidosis can be diagnosed without a cardiac biopsy. Many cases of AL, AL amyloidosis can be diagnosed without a cardiac biopsy. In the context of, a, context of a peripheral biopsy, say a fat or a renal biopsy and supportive cardiac testing, but still under certain circumstances, particularly the PYP test abnormal and the free light chain test or immunofixation abnormal, 
that's where you really need the heart biopsy to figure out whether the patient has AL or ETTR, uh, or possibly both, just to confuse you, <laughs> because that can also happen. The tissue is absolutely the issue, as they say, and that's what you really need to know. So I hope that's been uh, uh, helpful to try to understand um, how we approach patients diagnostically for cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, thank you for your attention.